Hey everyone, uh, welcome uh, to Bond Hall if you're not already from here. I see some new faces up in the crowd. Uh, we have a real privilege this evening of, uh, of hearing His Excellency Bishop Ken Rhodes uh, address a school of architecture, which I hear does not really happen very often. Certainly it's the first time it's happened here at Notre Dame. I'm saying that you're down lately, in fact. <laughs> A little bit of a, a story. I just came back from Europe, and often you say Notre Dame there because they don't know what you mean by Notre Dame. <laughs> Unless you sing the alma mater at San Clemente. <laughs> <laughs> it was an Italian choir who sings, uh, who says Notre Dame, and then says, Glory is thy fame. Anyway, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been here for 23 years, and my colleagues have been here for more. But uh, what sets this school apart is the fact that we are at Notre Dame. And uh, our school uh, stands for a lot of things. Uh, one of those things is community, something that the Catholic Church uh, also promotes and, and reveres. And if it does that, it should know how to build one, and I think that's where we come in. Uh, we think we know how to build communities that are enduring, that are that will revere their citizens, the people that uh, grow up and flourish in these places. So uh, it, is, it is an institution uh, that, and a school that believes in, in values, believes in uh, that humans have dignity, that they should flourish in their lives, and that they should serve God's, God's word and God's will. The other part of this that is very important for our school is that uh, Notre Dame uh, uh, talks much about uh, the unity of knowledge. And there are a few disciplines at the university that actually bring all of this together. I know it's taking some liberties with the meaning, but you'll allow me that. Uh, virtually every discipline that's taught at a university is, has to be at least understood by an architect. And you know, we, we're artists on one level, we are engineers at another. We have to know to add and subtract, get areas, and a few other things. Uh, we have to understand something about anthropology, something about all the sciences, chemistry, business, uh, something about business, something about the law. In short, the totality of what a university engages comes together in the creative process of building cities and building buildings. So there are many reasons why a Catholic university should have a school of architecture. But we, I think, are unique in that we can bring uh, certain aspects that are uh, not discussed at other places for various reasons. Uh, but here they're discussed freely and generously and debated, and we are all better for it. So I uh, look forward to hearing your talk tonight, uh, uh, Bishop Rhodes. And uh, thank you and welcome you. And, I'll ask Duncan Stroich to actually give a form of deduction. I think I've spoken already too long. <laughs> so um, we're honored tonight to uh, have a bishop here. And I think a lot of you know that a bishop is always connected to a, what building? Cathedral. And of course, in that cathedral, there's a, special thing that a bishop sits on? Cathedra. Cathedra. So the cathedra and the cathedral. And I wanted to start with that because you know what our diocese is called? The Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend. It's a hyphenated diocese. And hyphenated dioceses mean that there are two cathedrals. The Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Fort Wayne and of course, the Basilica of the Sacred Heart at Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> or so many people think. In fact, do you know that, that uh, famous um, little study, the top 25 college cathedrals in America? Do you know that one? Has anybody seen that? 25 top college cathedrals. What's wrong with this picture, guys? <laughs> anyway, no, the Basilica is not a cathedral, but it's cathedral-like. So. Um, his Excellency Bishop Rhodes was installed as the ninth Bishop of Fort Wayne, South Bend, January 13, 2010.
He studied at Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and St. Charles Borromeo Seminary outside of Philadelphia. Earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy. He did his theological studies at the North American College and the Pontifical Gregorian University in some city in Europe, France, Paris, uh, where he later earned advanced degrees in dogmatic theology and canon law. He also studied Spanish at the University of Salamanca in Spain, and he can habla bien en español. <laughs> he was ordained a deacon at St. Peter's Basilica, then ordained a priest of the Harrisburg Diocese, where he became a parochial vicar and also ministered in Spanish-speaking speech apostolates. He taught courses in systematic theology, canon law, and Hispanic ministry at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, and was rector there from 1997 to 2004. St. John Paul II appointed him Bishop of the Diocese of Harrisburg 2004. While he was there, he undertook a beautiful restoration of the Cathedral of St. Patrick, which I was believed after a great Italian saint. He was appointed the ninth bishop of the Diocese of Fort Wayne in 2009 by Pope Benedict XVI and installed January 13, 2010 in the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Fort Wayne. I think I already said that. Bishop Rhodes serves as a member of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family, Life, and Youth. He also serves as a consultant to the USCCB Committee on Pro-Life Activities along with many other church activities. The motto on his coat of arms is Veritatem in Caritate, which translates into English as... Yeah, go ahead. Truth in... Truth and Charity. Please welcome His Excellency Bishop Rhodes. Thank you, Dr. Stroik, and thank you, Dean Lacutis, for that kind, those kind introductions. I um, um, would like to begin with a, a prayer, and then, um, then we'll see how it goes with the PowerPoint. <laughs> I have to tell you, I am not at all nervous giving a speech. I give speeches all the time. I give homilies all the time. But this is a historic day in my life, the first time I've ever used a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so we'll see. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. St. Thomas and St. Barbara, pray for us. St. Jude and St. Isidore of Seville, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, why did I just invoke those four saints? Well, you probably know why I invoke Saints Thomas and Barbara, patron saints of architects. Did everybody know that? Some did. And if you want to know why, I have no idea. <laughs> you can look it up, or I'm sure Dean Lacutis or Dr. Stroik or one of the other professors can explain why. Now. I'll have to tell you why I invoke St. Jude, whose feast day was yesterday, he's an apostle, and St. Isidore of Seville. After I had, I had a mass at a parish named St. Jude in Fort Wayne, and I said to the priest, tomorrow I'm giving a lecture um, to the uh, School of Architecture at Notre Dame, I said, and, but you know, I'm really nervous about doing a PowerPoint, I said, who's the patron saint of technology? And he said, just say St. Jude, impossible causes. <laughs> and then I, on my iPhone check, I put in patron saint of technology. And St. Isidore of Seville came up, 7th century. <laughs> because he evidently wrote 20 volumes. He was trying to write everything that's known about the world in these 20 volumes. 
So I guess it's kind of like the internet, you know? So anyhow, this isn't a talk on the lives of the saints, but I'm really happy to be with you. Now, I'm not an expert in architecture, you know that. I speak as a bishop of the church about your service of the church through architecture. And it's a service for which I'm deeply grateful, uh, especially here at Notre Dame because your school of architecture is renowned for its service of the church, in not only preserving, but in fostering anew the church's rich tradition of sacred architecture. And I can speak for my brother bishops who talk about this service of, of the church being provided by your school, really a pioneer. And you serve the church through architecture in a variety of ways. Through architecture, here we go. Oh, see, I already made a mistake. Oh, I'm not supposed to do that. It's the wrong thing. See, I told you I'd be nervous about this. Which am I supposed to? Oh, here it is. Oh, good. Before I talk about that, I want to... Oh, Duncan mentioned the uh, cathedral, the Bishop's Church. This is the cathedral in Fort Wayne, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. A couple years ago, I celebrated its 150th anniversary, so I think it's about 153 years old now. Very, very beautiful. We have a cathedral here in South Bend, St. Matthew Cathedral, and I don't tell Monsignor Heinz, the pastor, that I have no pictures of St. Matthews. <laughs> this, is, this is the inside of Immaculate Conception Cathedral, so you can see how beautiful it is, the Gothic style. And my cathedra is, is to the left um, of the altar, my chair. No one else can sit in that chair, by the way. They always tease. Now, service of the church's mission. And I was thinking about how church architects, especially, because I'm talking about architects of churches and sacred places, chapels, etc. I would say, number one, you serve the church's mission of proclaiming the word of God. What I want to, I'll flesh this out a little bit in the talk. I'm not going to get into each one now. But what I would like, if you're, designing uh, the architecture for a church, try to keep these things in mind. How does this work help to proclaim the word of God? Something to meditate on. How does it teach the faith? The teaching of the faith. The new evangelization through beauty. Talk about that later in my talk. How does it serve the sacred liturgy and prayer? And how does it serve the mission, church's mission of charity? This might be the one that might be most difficult to figure out. But I believe architecture can serve the church's mission of charity, and I, I'll talk about that a little bit. I think it's helpful just to look at your profession as a vocation, as looking back at the more general vocation of the laity in the church, as taught by the Second Vatican Council. The council insisted on the unique character of the vocation of the laity in these words, to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs and ordering them to the plan of God. One sentence that says so much. All lay people in the church have the calling to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs, the affairs of the world, earthly matters, and ordering these things to the plan of God. And I think when this vocation is lived out in the architectural profession, 
When men and women of faith become architects who see their work as a call from God, when they are led by the spirit of the gospel, their lives and their work can contribute to the sanctification of the world. It becomes a participation in God's work of creation and also a means of growth in holiness. You know, the Second Vatican Council taught about the universal call to holiness. That's a call rooted in our baptism. We're all called to be holy. And this call to holiness requires each of us, of course, to follow Jesus Christ, to pray, to listen to the Word of God, to participate in the church's liturgy and sacraments, and to practice the commandment of love in all circumstances of our life. This call to holiness is also related to one's profession, certainly related to if someone has the vocation of marriage. It's related to their marriage and family life, being a, a holy, good, faithful husband or wife, father or mother. But it's also related to one's profession. It's not lived, this call to holiness is not lived apart from one's profession or separate from one's profession. One doesn't le or shouldn't leave their faith aside when they go to work, whatever that work might be. Whatever one's profession, including architecture, when one's life is one of faith, hope, and charity, lived also in the workplace, it contributes to the building up of the church, the communion of saints. Those in the profession of architecture, I think, quite literally contribute to the building up of the church by building sacred places. Places where the community of faith gathers to listen to the word of God and to celebrate the sacraments. And that's why I believe sacred architecture can be a powerful instrument for the new evangelization, especially through beauty. It can help build faith. It can help nurture people's faith. And I'd like to give an example. It's kind of a little lengthy example, but I thought I'd bring in a personal experience of my growing up in a small city in Pennsylvania, Lebanon, Pennsylvania, near Hershey. You've heard of Hershey? Well, you can smell the chocolate all the way in Lebanon. Um, in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, my parish was called St. Mary's. And its official title was Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Parish, but everyone called it St. Mary's. And the parish church affected my own life of faith. And I was really thinking a lot about this. How the parish church, not just the community, but also the church building, affected my growth in the faith as a child and as a teenager. Now my parish, um, oops, see I'm not used to this yet. My home parish was founded in 1810, older than any parish in the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend. And its original church was built in 1812. Here it is. And it's like many of those churches in the early years of the Catholic Church in the northeastern United States and also in the Midwest. A lot of times the first churches that were built were rather simple, sometimes wooden frame, or in this case, brick. Uh, I think it's brick. Um, but it was very beautiful inside, as you can see on the left. So that church was built in 1812. That was um, uh, where the first parishioners worshipped. By the 1870s, and this happened, again, in the Midwest and in the Northeast, because of immigration, the church became too small for the congregation. So the ch second church was built and dedicated in 1880. Now, that's the church I grew up in. Like so many Catholic churches at that time, that were built at that time, it was really a beautiful testament to the faith and the sacrifice of immigrant Catholics. It was, as you can see, a beautiful Gothic structure. Upon each side of the church, you can see on the left, the outside, were towers terminating with octagonal spires 132 feet high 
topped with gilt crosses. And the church was right in the middle of downtown Lebanon. Now, Lebanon was mostly a Lutheran community. Yet, the center of this Lutheran, mostly Lutheran city, was this imposing Catholic monument and St. Mary's Church, right in the middle of downtown. And Irish and German Catholics sacrificed much to build this church. They adorned it with frescoes and large, beautiful stained glass windows, a high main altar, as you can see, of Gothic art. That high altar rose 45 feet from the floor. The sanctuary to the cross surmounting the top. I always remember at the very top there's an eye. E-Y-E, eye. The eye of God looking at you. That was kind of scary as a kid. But <laughs> The side altars traditionally dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. They were also beautiful Gothic design. The high altar had all kinds of statues, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Twelve Apostles, saints to whom the parishioners were particularly devoted, like St. Patrick. And at the center was a prominent statue of Mary being assumed from a tomb into heaven with angels at her sides. Again, the title of the church was Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So my family worshipped in this church during my childhood. I received my first Holy Communion there and my confirmation. My class was the last confirmation class in that church. But I remember a lot, every time we would go downtown, that time you shopped downtown, there weren't malls outside, um, we would always make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament in this church. It was our spiritual home. So this church and its architecture affected me. Because every time I would go there, seeing the sacredness and the beauty of this place, I was naturally drawn to prayer even as a child, to lift up my mind and heart to God. Now, it was in 1971, I was in eighth grade, the church was closed because an engineering report revealed that the church structure was unsafe. So people, the people were shocked, devastated to be true. Not only the parishioners, but even the, the whole community. Uh, mass had to be moved to the school auditorium, and that's where I attended Mass all through high school. And the decision was made to not repair the church, but to demolish it. And people were heartbroken. I don't know, I was too young to remember what it would have cost to restore it, but remember, this was the early 70s, and they weren't thinking about those things. So, But they did remove the beautiful statues and the beautiful stained glass windows and kept them for safekeeping in the basement of the school. Unfortunately, some of those treasures were damaged by a Hurricane Agnes. There was a flood in 1972 that destroyed some of the things from the old church that they had kept in the basement. But what they did salvage was restored and placed in the new church. Now, the new church, which is the third St. Mary's Church, was completed and opened in 1974. Before I show you that, let me tell you a little bit. The new church did incorporate the beautiful stained glass windows from the old church and some of the statues. As I said, some of the statues were destroyed by the flood. But they completely changed the architectural style. And it really was following the fashion of the time. Um, now, <laughs> on the right, you see the outside, and I mean, keep in mind how this city, that that downtown Gothic church was right in the center of downtown, and it was really a monument of faith, and it was replaced by this. Now, you can see in the inside, they did keep that, that statue of the Assumption, you can see Mary the tomb and the angels. You see the stained glass, but it's a fan-shaped church. There's not even a center aisle, so brides hated it. That's a side aisle if you had to go by. But um, the, um, you know, it, it was, it's, it's a, I, I don't know how you call the exterior, bland, I think is the best word, comes to my mind. It no longer soared upward to heaven. Without going into much detail, you, I think you get the picture. And why am I sharing this with you? Because this is what I experienced in my life. And I want you to know how it affected 
my faith life and the, the community. No longer, when I entered church, was I moved to contemplate heavenly realities. Maybe I did when I would look at the windows. Um, I could still pray there, but it wasn't as natural to pray as in the new, as in, uh, in the new church as it was in the old. The building didn't draw me into prayer like the old church. But yet, in faith, I knew the Blessed Sacrament was there. But it was no longer in the center. It was off to the side. And the way they made the tabernacle is it was made to look exactly like the pulpit, the ambo, on each side. Which, that's another problem. But I share this with you to impress upon you the spiritual vocation that you have as architects. How what you do in building churches impacts people and their spiritual lives. And I don't blame anybody for what happened at my home parish church. It was the 1970s. There was a lot of confusion. There was confusion in theology. There was confusion about the liturgy. And this confusion and the trendiness of the times did a lot of damage. And that damage naturally flowed into the area of church art and architecture. Well, in this era of the new evangelization, I believe we've entered into an exciting time for the church. And I think of Pope Benedict's hermeneutic of continuity, not rupture. Continuity, not rupture. Whether we're talking about theology, liturgy, or architecture. Um, and I believe that with this, and this is really, I think, taking hold. This idea, I see it in my priests, I see it in so many uh, young people, this importance of, of tradition, but not, you know, just staying fixed in the past. I'm not saying that, but continuity. And all this will lead, I think, with the help of God's grace, to a new springtime for the church, and hopefully a discovery or rediscovery of the faith in the lives of many people. And you have a part to play in this exciting venture of the new evangelization. Pope St. John Paul II wrote a letter, famous letter, to artists in 1999. Maybe you've read it. And, and St. John Paul II wrote how the human craftsman mirrors the image of God as creator. He stated, with loving regard, the divine artist passes on to the human artist a spark of his own surpassing, surpassing wisdom, calling him or her to share in his creative power. This, of course, applies very well to architects. Using your God-given gifts, your work, can be a creative artistry, giving form and meaning to the natural elements of the earth. This is truly a sharing in God's creative power. You thus mirror the image of God as creator. In his letter to artists, St. John Paul wrote a paragraph where he speaks specifically about architecture and their service to the church. I don't know if you've seen this quote, um, but when I read the letter to artists, I said, I wonder if he said anything specifically to architects. This is he's preparing this talk. And sure enough, there is a paragraph. And this is what he wrote. The church needs architects because she needs spaces to bring the Christian people together and celebrate the mysteries of salvation. After the terrible destruction of the last world war and the growth of great cities, a new generation of architects showed themselves adept at responding to the exigencies of Christian worship, confirming that the religious theme can still inspire architectural design in our own day. Not infrequently, these architects have constructed churches which are both places of prayer and true works of art. 
And I love that, you know, the idea of you're building churches. Remember, you're building places of prayer and works of art. Now, I'm not sure which architects and churches the Holy Father had in mind um, when he said that, but, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I think he's thinking of Europe, and I, I don't really know about the post-World War II churches in Europe that he has in mind. But I'm grateful, but I think what he says is, is, is very important. I'm grateful for what you do here, Notre Dame, to promote the building of churches that are both places of prayer and true works of art. Because really, the church needs you. Bishops, like myself, need you. We need your talents. We need your ingenuity. Uh, we need you to proclaim and serve the mystery of faith in what you do. That your works proclaim the truth, the goodness, and the beauty of the Christian faith. Throughout the history of the church, art and architecture have served the church as expressions of the Christian faith. I'm sure you probably study this in your classes, so I'm not going to do a lot about the history, but I do want to review it a little bit. In the early centuries, art and architecture adapted the forms of the classical Greek and Roman world. Now, I studied in Rome for seven years, and, and I, every Thursday we had off. We had no classes on Thursdays. We had classes on Saturdays. So every Thursday I was out, um, you know, visiting churches, visiting monuments, uh, I never stayed in, or I went on day trips, whatever. So I was, I, I've, I didn't stay at the college. And, you know, so I learned a lot. And, and as an amateur, I'm not in any way expert in this, but I did have an appreciation for the classical styles that I saw there. Uh, for example, the basilica form and structure. Um, basilica architecture was adapted for the celebration of the church's liturgy, as you know. And the, and the results were amazing. You know, basilicas like the old St. Peter's, you know, it was, that was a style of architecture in the, in the Roman world that the church took over as sacred places for the liturgy. So the old St. Peter's, you've probably seen design. If you visit Rome, uh, when you're in the crypt, you're in part of the old Constantinian Basilica. Another amazing basilica, St. John Lateran. By the way, this is the Cathedral of Rome. Most people think St. Peter's is the cathedral. St. John Lateran is the cathedral of the Diocese of Rome. This is the Pope's Cathedral, not St. Peter's. But again, that, that basilica architecture that was taken over uh, to be a Christian church. And the art that filled these churches, the mosaics, the sculptures, the paintings, all of this raised the hearts and the minds of Christians to the mysteries of our faith. Even though that style of architecture wasn't originally Christian. And these great buildings were functional for the liturgy. But as St. John Paul II wrote, Yeah, I do. He said, the functional is always wedded to the creative impulse, inspired by a sense of the beautiful and an intuition of the mystery. From here came the various styles well known in the history of art. The strength and simplicity of the Romanesque, expressed in cathedrals and abbeys, slowly evolved into the soaring splendors of the Gothic. These forms portray not only the genius of an artist, but the soul of a people. In the play of light and shadow, in forms at times massive, at times delicate, structural considerations certainly come into play, but so too do the tensions peculiar to the experience of God, the mystery both awesome and Well, this art and architecture helped form the culture as it became a culture more and more imbued, imbued with the gospel. And this continued then in the Renaissance, as you know. 
great artists and architects like Michelangelo and Bramante and Bernini and Borromini and Maderno, rendering visible, John Paul wrote, the perception of the mystery which makes the church a universally hospitable community, mother and traveling companion to all men and women in their search for God. Don't we see this in the new St. Peter's Basilica with its colonnade reaching out, spreading out, spreads out from the basilica like two arms open to welcome the whole human family. I mentioned the adoption and adaptation of classical architecture for Christian churches. And then the continuing development and evolution of various architectural forms, the Basilica, the Romanesque, the Gothic, and then the Renaissance and the Baroque. There's a continuity. All of these forms had an order to them and were able to reflect God's creative activity. What did God do? He brought order from chaos. God is the giver of order, not disorder. He's the giver of harmony, not disharmony. And in my opinion, some forms of modern forms of architecture have moved in a direction that do not reflect order. And that leads to a certain expression that I don't think sufficiently serves the Christian vision of things, let alone the church's liturgy. And I don't have any slides of examples. I actually only put this together the last two days. I didn't have time. But some forms of modern architecture don't seem to me to be suitable for church buildings. Because unlike Greek architecture or Roman architecture, which expressed ideas of perfection, of order, of beauty, of truth, they were compatible with Christian teaching. Some architecture today doesn't seem to me, to be compatible. Attempts to make them compatible have often revealed problematic theological views because oftentimes it's theology that can be skewed. And then that influences architecture. The great treasure of Christian art and architecture was born from faith within the church. When there's a crisis of faith, like in our culture today, this can also be seen in art and architecture. We've seen this, we even see this in some churches today, and we've seen it in recent decades, even in the celebration of the liturgy in some places. Because the sense of the transcendent and the sense of the sacred can be lost. I think it's imperative that we recover the sense of the sacred in the celebration of the liturgy and in the church's art and architecture. Truly, sacred art and architecture, like the liturgy, and also liturgical music, I want to add, must be oriented to God and not to the self. You know, some liturgical songs sounds like we're praising ourselves, not God. Catholic art and architecture should be in continuity, like the liturgy, with the tradition of the church through the ages. A church should lift one's heart and mind to God, not to ourselves gathered together to worship him. Beautiful church architecture indeed invites people to lift their minds and hearts to God. In two th- I, I used a lot of John Paul. I want to move now to Benedict. In 2010, Pope Benedict XVI traveled to Barcelona, Spain, to dedicate the Basilica of the Holy Family. Oops, that's St. Peter's. <laughs> oh well, you know what St. Peter's looks like. Oops, I missed this too. Uh, oh well, okay, you can see I'm an amateur in this. These are all the points I already gave. God is the giver of order, not of disorder. Sorry about this.
Again, this is my first time, so I'll get better. Time goes. There we go. The Basilica of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. I've never been there, even though I was in Spain for a summer, but I never got to Barcelona. During that visit to Barcelona, Pope Benedict praised the architect of this church, Antoni Gaudi. By the way, he's servant of God. He's on his way to be out of and uh, I'd like to share with you some of the things Pope Benedict said about Gaudi and the Church of the Holy Family. First of all, Pope Benedict said that Antoni Gaudi was the soul and the artisan of this project. Now it's going to appear. It was Gaudi's Christian faith that motivated that inspired him. The Pope said that Gaudi conceived the church he was designing as a monument of praise in stone to God. I was thinking for architects building churches, that's a great thing to think about. That you, you know, to have that intention to build a monument of praise in stone to God. I believe that's the true spirit that we need. And architects of churches today. Gaudi was a very gifted architect, and he was a man of deep faith. He sought to bring the gospel to people through his architecture. Gaudi, and this is a quote from Benedict, Gaudi conceived of and projected the church of the Holy Family as a profound catechesis on Jesus Christ. Remember how I said at the beginning, one of the things an architect can do in serving the church's mission is teaching the faith. And that's why Gaudi, when he built this uh, great church of the Holy Family, on the outside there are three porticos, huge, and they are, Pope Benedict said, a catechesis on the life of Jesus Christ, a great rosary, which is the prayer of ordinary people a prayer in which are contemplated the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious mysteries of our Lord. So you can go in one of the porticos, one of the big entrances, and you have all this outside sculpture of, of um, and I, I think this is the nativity portico, um, you know, each of the mysteries of the rosary. So this would be the joyful mysteries. God want, I mean, Gaudi wanted the church to be a home for everybody, and not just the inside, but the outside, for ordinary people who would walk by, whether they were Christian or non-Christian. And his faith inspired him to charity. Remember I mentioned how, look at that interior. Um, his faith. Faith inspired him to charity. He designed and financed from his own savings the creation of a school for the children of the workers and the poorest families of the neighborhood. And that's very beautiful. That's probably one of the reasons he's a servant of God on the way to sainthood. And this is what he said. And I think this is something, I mentioned the service of charity of architects, something that maybe we don't think much about. He said, the poor must always find a welcome in the church which is an expression of Christian charity. That's why I'm so against anyone ever charging admission to go into to a church, like in some churches in Europe. No, the church has, should be a home for the poor. So we see the authentic faith of this architect, Antoni Gaudio. It's a faith expressed in charity. Pope Benedict said, the church of the Holy Family reflects all the grandeur of the human spirit in its openness to God. And he called it a splendid work, full of religious symbols, delicate in the interlacing of its forms, fascinating in its play of light and color, as it were an immense sculpture in stone, the result of profound faith of the spiritual sensitivity and artistic talent of Antoni Gaudi. The 
still building. It's not done yet. You know, it's how many years? It's over 100 years, right? Since he started, I think. Um, now, Pope Benedict said that inspiration count came to Gaudi from three books. Three books which nourished him as a man, as a believer, and as an architect. The book of nature, the book of sacred scripture, and the book of the liturgy. In this way, he brought together the reality of the world and the history of salvation as recounted in the Bible and made present in the liturgy. He made stones, trees, and human life part of the church so that all creation might come together in praise of God. But at the same time, he brought the sacred images outside so as to place before people the mystery of God revealed in the birth, passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what a great lesson for church architects to use these three books, the books of nature, scripture, and the liturgy in designing and building churches. All these three books lifting up us toward the author of these three books, the author of nature, the author of the Bible, and the author of the liturgy, God. Beauty. The artist has a special relationship to beauty. And... The Second Vatican Council spoke of the noble ministry of artists when their works reflect in some way the infinite beauty of God and raise people's minds to him. At the end of the Second Vatican Council, the council issued a message to artists and appealed to artists in these words. This world in which we live needs beauty in order not to sink into despair. Beauty, like truth, brings joy to the human heart and is that precious fruit which resists the erosion of time, which unites generations and enables them to be one in admiration. So when we look on plans for new churches or restorations of churches in our diocese, and we have a lot going on right now, by, by the way, a lot of campaigns, a couple new church, some big new churches, I always ask the planners to list beauty as a number one priority in their planning. Now I go into a building committee meeting and they're giving me everything and talking about the cost and everything, and I always say, would be beautiful. That's number one. Because churches should speak of the mystery of God's beauty. The world needs this. The world needs beauty. The world needs God. God is beauty. It seems that some artists and architect uh, might not see beauty as the legitimate end of art. This is part of a bigger cultural crisis in the West. You know, currents of secularism, relativism, and hedonism. Some art is not only not beautiful, and some architecture is not only not beautiful, but mocks beauty, and even mocks God. There are ideologically driven movements that assault tradition and assault Christian culture. And these movements have found their way into the world of art and even architecture. I mean, you see art, for example, in some uh, museums that are mocking the Christian faith, really desecrating Christ or, or the Virgin Mary with urine and other things, and, and they call it art. Beautiful churches contribute to the creation of a society and a culture that is not forgetful of God. At a time when many seem to try to build their lives without God, a time of increasing secularism, secularism we need churches that remind us of our origin, our purpose, and our destiny, God in heaven. 
they should reflect a Catholic worldview. So our churches should not be stripped of the imaginative elements that uplift the human spirit. They should inspire the faithful. You know, we see throughout church history heresies from the early church that get repeated down through the centuries. Heresies like iconoclasm seem to reappear. Iconoclasm, you know, destruction of all images. Um, I think about how mosaics and statues and stained glass and sacred vessels and vestments and art within churches, churches built of noble materials and in harmonious design, not only speak of our Catholic faith, but they also lead us to contemplation. So a good question to ask is, do our churches lead us to an encounter with the living God who is truth and beauty itself? Because churches should be places of encounter between God and man. Because that's what the liturgy is. But the place where the liturgy takes place serves the same sacramental end or purpose. This is what the catechism is. Catechism says this, Christians construct buildings for divine worship. I think we recognize that church. These visible churches are not simply gathering places, but signify and make visible the church living in this place, the dwelling of God with men, reconciled and united in Christ. So there are to be houses of God, temples, dwelling places of God. After all, Catholic churches house the Blessed Sacrament. They're not auditoriums, they're not theaters. They're places built for divine worship, so they need to be worthy of their purpose. They should point us to heavenly realities, the heavenly liturgy, like the Basilica here at Notre Dame. And through beauty and images, connect us to the angels and saints in praise of the Most Holy Trinity. Our churches should offer a foretaste of heaven. Architects and artists use the matter of the earth, material elements. But this matter created by God can be used to reveal heavenly realities. And the Second Vatican Council taught that church buildings are to be signs and symbols of heavenly realities. Through the material world, we can connect to spiritual realities. And this is part of the Catholic vision. The, the Catholic teaching of, and theology of sacramentality. Church buildings are to be sacramental signs. And this should be reflected in Catholic architecture. Vatican Council I proclaimed that the world was created for the glory of God. And St. Bonaventure explained that God created all things not to increase his glory, but to show it forth and to communicate. So artists and architects of churches can use the materials of earth to give glory to the Creator and to show forth His glory. A couple weeks ago, the architectural theologian Dennis McNamara spoke to all the priests of our diocese, Diocese of Fort Wayne South Bend, gave us two wonderful lectures on sacred art and architecture. So I highly recommend his works. They help us to see the theological principles that I've touched on, especially the sacramental principle that should underpin church architecture. His book, Catholic Church Architecture and the Spirit of the Liturgy, is really wonderful. And I also, and I don't know many of the professors here, um, and I do know Professor Duncan Stroik very well, because he's helped me in a lot of projects. So I highly recommend his book, I don't know if you've read it. It's wonderful. The Church Building as a Sacred Place, Beauty, Transcendence, and the Eternal. And, you know, um, excellent scholarship and a great contribution to the necessary renewal of architecture in the Catholic Church and its re-engagement with our tradition. You know, I titled this talk 
serving the church through architecture. And Professor Stroik and other architects, professors here, who exemplify this service make me so very grateful. And I'm sure many other bishops very grateful. And one final thought. The call to holiness I talked about at the beginning. When you use your gifts... Thank you, Professor Stroik. I forgot. <laughs> Do you recognize that church? Our Lady of Guadalupe in La Crosse, Wisconsin. When you, use, when you use your gifts to serve the church and the building up of God's kingdom on earth, it's a means for you to become holy, a means to sanctification. You can bear witness to Christ through your work. And you do your work with a spirit of faith, hope, and charity. Then you're revealing the infinite richness of the mystery of Christ. And I think your own spirituality, your own prayer life is essential. How did Gaudi build that basilica of the, sacred, of the Holy Family? He was a man of, of deep prayer. And prayer becomes a stimulus also for using your gifts in architecture to serve God and his kingdom on this earth. And it's important to live an integrated life, not two parallel lives, a spiritual life and a secular life. Everything we do, including our work, enters into the plan of God. So I want to encourage you to live an integrated life, your prayer, your faith, your work, state and life vocation, all united to your intimate relationship with Christ in the church. And I pray that you allow yourself to be guided interiorly and sustained by the Holy Spirit in your work. Because the church needs you for the great venture of the new evangelization. You know, at the visitation, the Blessed Virgin Mary exclaimed, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. May your lives and your work as architects proclaim the greatness of the Lord and help all of us to rejoice in God our Savior. Thank you. Excellent question. I think, um, speaking in the United States, I think um, we went through a period. I mentioned the 1970s, it began before that, and it's really gone all the way through the 80s, 90s. But then a change started happening. But you see it also in the liturgy, where, and especially with not only theologians, but bishops, where you know, there was for a time that idea of that the Second Vatican Council, that it brought a, a radical change, a discontinuity, a rupture in the church's tradition. And that had its effects in architecture and art. 
And there were many who really believed that a church, for example, they looked at should be merely functional, that all the paintings and elaborate struck, uh, sculptures or all of those things, they, they would call them distractions from the liturgy or, or all kinds of things. So there was a philosophy, a mindset that was this, this modern mindset but it really wasn't the mindset of your average Catholic. You know, I, I think there was a wisdom in the up, I mean, people were devastated. When we've restored churches to their original beauty, people have rejoiced and said, thank you. I remember restoring the cathedral in Harrisburg. I got not one complaint. People were thrilled. But there are still, that fragmentation you mentioned, there are still people out there. I mean, I, there's been a shift to, to the better. But there are still people out there that are promoting forms of architecture that I don't think are compatible with our faith. When I mentioned disorder and disharmony, for example, churches that are, and, and I'm not an expert in this, but Churches that are designed that are, um, for example, that there's no order to it, or it's, it's almost, I'm trying to think of an example, but um, there are many of them. And there's still architects building those kind of churches. But it shouldn't be allowed. I mean, bishops need to enter here. You know, bishops have to approve these things. You know, and I wouldn't approve a church that had that kind of a design. You know, I think bishops, too, were confused through a period of, of several decades. And I remember once, in, in this diocese, there's a variety. We have beautiful churches, we have ugly churches, we have those in between. Well, I won't tell you which I think are ugly. But, um, but what I would say, for example, is, like, I remember there was one beautiful outside church in Fort Wayne that I, I was going for my first visit for a confirmation. I said, oh wow, this is one of the things in the city, it's an older church, but towers that soared vertically to heaven. And I was really had this anticipation for walking in and what I was going to see. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I walked in. The whole sanctuary had been stripped. And you know what was in the sanctuary? The the pipes of the organ was the main thing. So where, where I'm sure, and I saw old, old pictures where there had been a beautiful altar and beautiful art and everything else. But when they did that, when they stripped everything, and then imagine putting the pipes of the organ, that's the main thing. I mean, it's, I mean, those people were heartbroken. But again, it was certain people with an ideological ideology at that time, that was the way where the direction they were going. And even some bishops were misled and thinking, well, that's what we're supposed to be doing after the Second Vatican Council. But when you read the documents of the Second Vatican Council, especially the document on liturgy, nowhere does it say to strip churches like that. You know, so, so I think there still is that problem. There still is a, 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 some disagreement. But the trend is really to the continuity that I've been speaking about my young priests and my seminarians, I'd say 100%, you know, but I see it in the bishops as well. Yes. Oops. Yes, go ahead. First of all, just thank you, Your Excellency, for your encouragement for beauty. It's, it's more than you know, but my main question is, in churches that already have their set structure from, say, the 70s, that don't necessarily have the budget to demolish and rebuild. Yet, what would you say to parishioners, artistic parishioners, who would like to do something with the space that's there to make it more of a prayerful experience who can't actually reform the space itself? Yeah. It's interesting. I had that discussion last night in the church where I had mass with the pastor. And I said, you're going to need some outside advice, but I think there can be things that are done here. Now, you can't change the, the semicircular um, what do you call it, shell kind of shaped building. But I think there were things that could be done in that sanctuary and some art, et cetera, that could, uh, I think there are things that can be done. 
I think the challenge, this would be a good challenge for you. It's probably more artistic, but I think it's architectural as well. I mean, both artistic and architectural. That, that to think about how some of these buildings that we have, they can't be made perfectly beautiful, but you could make them somewhat more beautiful that lift people's, even some of the sacramental things. I was thinking like a, a beautiful painting of saints and angels in heaven in the sanctuary. And I said, but where you have to watch is you don't want something that's going to clash with the architectural style either. So how you do that, I leave that up to your creativity. I don't know. I said to the pastor, I think something could be done here, but I don't know what. <laughs> I said, see some experts about how this can be made beautiful. I think it can be. I just don't know how to do it. Um, you know, I would think you could, that'd be a great project. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I was, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Bishop Rhodes, for coming. You honor us with your presence. Um, You're welcome. I, I was struck by <clears throat> something that you said about um, Gaudi, uh, that uh, he, he wanted La Sagrada Familia to um, uh, engage everybody who walked by. Um, I don't know if it's true in the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend, um, that there are documents that govern the siting of churches. But I'm under the impression that those documents exist, at least in other dioceses. And my impression is that those documents uh, do a set of guidelines for um, where churches are located that require, uh, that, that specify things like the number of cars that have to be accommodated, that inevitably require or at least presume that new churches will be suburban. What that means is that nobody walks by to engage these. People drive by. And I would say that even unless you're out of the if you're driving by at 30 or 40 miles an hour, you're not going to be able to stop and contemplate uh, the, the beauty of, of the work that's there. And so I realized that uh, uh, the, the Catholic Church followed, followed its parishioners in the great suburban migration after the Second World War. But I'm wondering if there's any thought that's being given either by you or by um, any, uh, any other bishops of thinking about ways in which, uh, two things. One is thinking about churches as the centers of neighborhoods in existing cities. But in the case of suburban congregations, um, suburban parishes, thinking about ways of designing the nucleus of the parish and its school and the property that it owns, because the church, uh, suburban churches build on pieces of property that can actually be little kind of urban nuclei. I'm just wondering if there's anybody thinking about that as a, uh, in addition to thinking about the, the beauty of the church, but thinking about the church as what it historically has always been, is a center uh, of, of neighborhoods, of being, you talk about integrating our lives, our spiritual life, and our, and our work. In the same way, I'm wondering if anyone's giving any thought to integrating churches back into a network of, uh, of you know, housing, neighborhoods, and cities. That is, I mean, I don't know. We don't have any guidelines on that. I'll answer that. I, I have not given it much thought. I, I mean, you're mentioning this is already making my wheels turn that this is something important. <laughs> I know one thing that I did think about was um, in building churches in those suburban areas, we always try to buy more land. Um, and I think it's important to have areas where people can walk around, maybe some wooden air, uh, wooded areas, uh, paths with Stations of the Cross or Mysteries of the Rosary or whatever. So it becomes a place where it just doesn't have a parking lot. You know, but actually places where where people can walk around. What you're saying, I think, would be very important. That, that's a great idea. I'd have to almost look at the area. Like we're building a new St. Pius Church, and I'm trying to think, like, would people walk by there? I don't think they drive by there. That's a very good point. Now, we have said we want it to be something that people driving by would take notice. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's, that's a big challenge. I, I like that challenge that you mentioned. I'm going to give that more thought. But I don't think it's been on the radar screen of many people, so I'll thank you for that. 
are, you know, we're, we're not really building, it's rare that we're building churches in cities now because we have more churches than we need for the population. Um, you're right, where we're building is, is in suburban areas, but maybe we should think more about it being a center of a neighborhood where people walk by. I don't know the question, I have a follow-up question if, if there aren't yeah. any others. But, um, Go ahead, yeah, I don't see another hand. Well, it, with respect to underused urban church properties, um, I'm wondering if, uh, again, this, this, this depends a lot on, I mean, it, it, it would be a means of evangelization, but it also depends upon um, the, you know, having the, the cadre of, of, uh, of priests or religious <coughs> do it. But, thinking about these uh, underused church properties as themselves becoming little outposts of the Catholic Church in, uh, in communities that, that would be occupied by you know, some small community, some small religious community um, that would you know, follow, follow the rule of St. Benedict or, or the rule of some, some, some kind of governing rule where mass would be said every day where the buildings like the, you know, a, a school that maybe is not being used gets repurposed for, um, for housing, um, that becomes, uh, again, kind of nucleus, in the same way that a suburban parish would be the nucleus of a neighborhood in the suburbs, that, 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 uh, that these underused church properties be, in effect, given to people you know, in the church and Christians who would care for them and sort of reinvigorate. Now that's something I have had experience in. Um, and in this diocese, more in Fort Wayne than in South Bend, although I have some thoughts about South Bend. I probably can't share them because I haven't talked to parishioners yet, but, but I'll tell you about Fort Wayne. Um, when I became bishop, there was a church that had been closed nearly 10 years in a very poor neighborhood. And, um, and it really was sad because there was no Catholic presence in that neighborhood anymore. They couldn't afford it. The community had become so small. And I brought with me from Harrisburg a new religious community of Franciscan Brothers. And um, I didn't even know about this church that had been closed. It was actually sold. And, um, but it was sold to a Catholic, and the Bishop Darcy sold them to, a, to him for like a dollar. But, um, you know, so I was going all around trying to find a place for this community of Franciscans that, that I knew was going to grow. It was seven guys when I came. Now there's 35 of them. So in five years, this religious community has grown from seven to 35 brothers. So anyhow, I was going around different places, and you know, not, there were a few places that were possible, but none of them really, as a residence, none of them really felt right to me. And then I, someone told me, well, you know, we have a closed Catholic church called St. Andrews in this very poor neighborhood. Oh, I'd like to go see it. And I walked in, because it was owned by Catholic, he let me in, and it had a whole complex, it had an old convent, an old rectory, everything, and, um, and a beautiful church, but it was falling apart. I mean, the, plaster had fallen, it wasn't, I guess, it wasn't heated and all that, so it was a mess. But as soon as I walked in, I heard Saint Fran uh, the words of Jesus to St. Francis, rebuild my house. I knew immediately, this is where they're gonna go. We, I brought the Franciscans in, we uh, got volunteers, restored the inside, the rectory is now a convent for a new group of cloistered nuns that I began. The old uh, convent is now where the brothers are. This is now a vibrant Catholic center, again, of that neighborhood. We reopened it. We got, by the way, I didn't buy it back. It was so funny because it was a devout, devoted Catholic, rather wealthy, who, who owned it. He said, you bishops must have gone to a separate school, uh, or the same school. Bishop Darcy gave this to us for a dollar. I put all this money in for a new roof and, uh, heating and all this stuff, and, and now you ask for it back after I put all the money <laughs> And he gave it to us back, really. So, and, and now this is a, a thriving. So that's an example, a real example of, exa of what you're saying. So I have ideas, you know, for South Bend as well. Yes? Did you also follow, the, I think this is so interesting, did you follow the impact of this uh, 
revitalization of the community. You said this was a very poor community. Because also, I think what Phil was mentioning, this is a kind of center. So this had a really great incentive for really a, a healing process in the labor. Did you kind of notice or study some of that? You know what's happened? One of the uh, charisms of the Franciscan community is evangelization. There aren't a lot of Catholics in that neighborhood. There weren't many left. That's why the church was. So they go door to door, spreading the faith to non-Catholics. Most go to no churches at all. It's kind of diverse, ethnically and racially diverse neighborhood. They now have a youth group of about 50 kids from the neighborhood, very few Catholics, but they teach them about the Bible. Some of the families have since become Catholic. This has become a center of evangelization. That's the problem. I mean, I'll say this about South Bend, and, and in Fort Wayne too, but, and cities across. Why haven't we evangelized in those neighborhoods? Why haven't we gone out to the African American communities and to those who are unchurched in those neighborhoods and just allowed them, okay, the people who come in for Mass on Sunday, very small, they're still loyal to their heritage, Polish or whatever, but that neighborhood changed. It's no longer, these neighborhoods are no longer Polish. But well, why haven't we, well, we've served them sometimes with, you know, physical things, you know, food or whatever, social services, but why not spread the faith in those neighborhoods? You know, uh, that's my vision of things. And like the brothers are really doing. And it's not by any pressure. We don't go out and proselytize. But most of these people don't have a spiritual home. Why not invite them to our spiritual home and create new communities? That's how I look at it. But you need priests and people with that evangelizing mentality. You know, the idea, like missionaries. It's really being missionaries in these neighborhoods. Now, some of the places Hispanics moved into the neighborhoods, and that was able, like in St. Albert and Our Lady of Hungary here in, Fort, in South Bend. So those parishes, old parishes, formerly Polish and Hungarian, they are now thriving because Catholics moved into those neighborhoods, Hispanics. And we had, like Our Lady of Hungary was dying until I put a bilingual priests there with Spanish masses and, and Spanish ministry. Now I don't worry about that church at all, and the school is doing well. So the, we have to create communities where these churches are located. Sounds like St. Francis is what you're doing. I'm trying. He's one of my heroes. <laughs> one of the things I wanted to mention, which maybe the students would be interested in too, is that we were invited as one of three architecture schools in the country to do a competition for the, uh, when the Pope comes to Philadelphia next fall. And so it's a competition that's open to all students from Notre Dame to do a design for the papal uh, sanctuary and altar and throne and all of that. Wonderful. And it's all due in January. Great, oh, I'd love to see. I'd love to see what you propose, yeah. I didn't hear about that before. Yes. I'm curious, are you planning or would you anticipate a position paper in the Vatican and the Council of Bishops that would summarize the views you put forth here today? Because I, I think it could have resonance beyond the Catholic Church and forming architects at large that meaning is important in architecture, which is something I think many, in fact, the uh, recent Pritzker Prize winner said he strives to create architecture I think we need something like that for the bishops. I really do. I mean, I, I think my paper probably isn't, I mean, maybe not professional enough, but maybe the ideas that I have here, we could do a good article maybe from it, but I would need some professional help to do it. I, I think it would be, um, I agree with you, I think it, it's needed. Um, you know, when, when you look at the letter to artists that Pope John Paul did, um, beautiful or 
or I use a lot of Pope Benedict from his homilies at the Basilica of the, of the Sagrada Familia, um, because I was looking for stuff in preparing this talk. I couldn't find very much. Well, I did find Duncan's and Dennis McNamara, really excellent stuff. But I tried to also make it personal, my own personal experience in my home parish and things like that. But I don't, th I think there is a need to get, uh, I don't know. Because we have, you have scholarly journals, obviously the sacred architecture, I love reading that. Um, that is that, is that published by, who's that published by? No idea. <laughs> Are you the publisher? Oh, the <laughs> oh, it's not just right? Okay. Um, but, but does that go to bishops? It goes all to bishops. Oh, good. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. But you're saying even beyond the bishops, you're saying to even. Yeah, why don't we do a letter to architects? A letter to architects. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. There's no, uh, when you mentioned like the, the Conference of Bishops, like I'm thinking to myself, where would this even fit yeah. in the structure? I mean, probably under liturgy, but it really is beyond liturgy. Yeah, but isn't there a precedent in, in, during the, uh, the world period the church take position about the direction of church design? Oh, yeah. But I just don't know where it is today. Now, the, at the Vatican, is there a pontifical associate or council or something for it? Culture. To be under there. Culture and art culture, yeah. I'm going to talk to some of the people about that idea. Yeah. Dr. Rabazzi, well, we want to thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much.